Good afternoon, everybody who is on the line to watch this uh, grand round. And today we have uh, uh, two speakers and uh, Dr. Daniel Malouf, MD, Professor, Department of Surgery, Director, Program of Transplantation, University of Maryland School of Medicine. And also, uh, Ch Dr. Chandra Bhatti, MD, Professor of Surgery, Director of Liver Transplant and Hepatobiliary Surgery, University of Maryland School of Medicine. They are going to talk today, a living donor, liver transplantation and role in transplant oncology. Doctors, you may begin now. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. Let me know if you can see the screen there. Yes, yes, I do. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so it's an honor for us to be here. Uh, for some of you that don't know me in the in the region, I joined University of Maryland in July 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. But previously, I was uh, 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 director of liver transplant at University of Virginia. And before that, I was in BCU in Richmond. And we've got very lucky to hire and, and bring with us Dr. Chandra Bari, that will be the speaker after me. He just arrived as the director of liver transplant, and he was trained also in UIC, but he also came from, from BCU in Richmond. So we have some common path in the past. But um, well, it's an honor for us to, to, uh, to be the speaker today. I will try to give an idea of the liver transplant process, especially my area of kind of of uh, expertise is living donor liver transplant that we started recently, restarted recently here in Maryland. And then Dr. Chandrabari experience in, in liver cancer. So it would be a great combination of expertise. We're gonna try to leave 10 minutes at the end for, for discussion, but that's that's my intro. Um, as you know, liver, liver is kind of a unique organ, uh, as you all know, has been spoken from, from the past, the capacity of liver regeneration. And that is being used in great advantage from our centers, but other other many centers uh, for living donor liver transplantation in patients that cannot wait enough to get delivered. And uh, I will go some of the challenges that we have in, the, in that matter. In, in general, living donor liver transplantation, I was when I was finishing my fellowship in the year 2000, there was a lot of talk about living donor liver transplantation. One of the guys that trained in BCU at that point was faculty, Dr. Marcos Amadeo, was kind of one of the leads in the country in living donor. And we saw a significant increase of the number of transplants by living donor then. I remember the, for the year 2001, we did 64 living donor cases in BCU. It was one of the largest in the country. It was not the largest in the country. But then there was a, a kind of event that happened in New York City when a donor died. It was kind of a very public and publicized um, did that really push the, the whole idea of living donor and, and down to for the following decade really. And as you can see in the year 2006, 2009, there was really a very small amount of living donor happening in the year, not because people will get great benefit out of it, but there was a lot of, you know, um, concerns about doing this and, and the, what the challenges are if some donor will have a complication. Since then, and obviously when you start balancing what, what the complications of doing living donors, but also the complication of having people sitting in the waiting list for a long time, the numbers start growing again and the kind of people start understanding the risk and benefit and being a little more tolerant to the risk that you were taking. And you can see that the numbers have increased to the last year was the first year that I think that we surpassed the, the one that was the, in, in the year 2000, above 515 uh, cases of living donors. Several uh, institutions have become kind of or are trying to become specialized in the area of living donor and kind of being guided by our colleagues in Asia and here in, in America by the Toronto group. And the main reason that we need to, to develop living donors is because we know that even if you go on the list, the chance that you get the liver transplant is not that high. And that is because we don't have enough organs um, um, or donors or organ donors to supply all the amount of patients that are in need of liver transplant. And this is not just in liver, I, I would say in general in all organs, but here obviously with focus in liver. So um, in the so recently we can see that 
the amount of, and this data a little bit old 2018, but you can see that the number of patients receiving living liver transplant via living donor was about 4.8% then, went up to 5.8 in 2019. And I think this year is about 6.4%. So it is slowly growing. The number of deceased donors also is becoming more and more challenged. We have about 10% of the organs that are recovered that has been discarded. And the main reason, as you will know, is obesity, NASH, and all the fatty liver complications related to, um, to the donors. But we know that if you if you go on the waiting list, depending of your blood type, you have about half, 50% of chances to receive a liver while waiting for liver transplant. So 50%, depending on the blood type, is, is kind of a, a, risk, a really need of increasing the volume of organ for transplantation. In fact, looking at the some of the proposals and some of the prediction models show that if, exist, so if there's not any change in the term of organ allocation or um, or quality improvement in organs with the uh, with the increasing uh, epidemic and uh, of obesity and alcohol and NASH, the uh, the amount of organ organs in the future to be uh, able to transplant probably will even decrease, making even more complicated or more difficult the chances of a patient that go in liver failure to receive an organ. Um, but there is not just just the, the issues related to uh, organ availability. There's also a reality related to um, the a population age. We also know that we have increased. If you look at the numbers today for units, the number of donors has increased, but a lot of this increase is related to what is called these DCD organs or donor after cardiac death that we know that sometimes are not as good as you can have with the brain uh, dead donor. And also there is a lot of regulatory oversight over the transplant center which really put a lot of pressures for those patients to do very well because when you have poor outcomes really reflected in the units and there is uh, there's a lot of pressure on those on centers, transplant centers, to have a risk aversion uh, uh, strategies. So, um, see, when we look at specific why we have challenges uh, receiving organs for uh, patients receiving organs for transplant, we know that donor age is a big, big issue. There's a significant increase in the population aging. Uh, the mean age in the U.S. is about 77 to 81 years old, depending in this in the female or males, but you can see we frequently get calls for organs offers that are 75. So we just last week we transplanted one patient with a donor from 74 years old and did very well. But we know that those organs, if they are exposed to colic schema time, longer colic schema time, or any challenge during the operation, those organs that don't have the capacity of regeneration like you have in other organs. The same, we, as you probably know, NASH prevalence 10 to 30%. I would say that now it's more than 30%. And we frequently go and look at organs that eventually end up to be fatty livers. Um, we know some, some tricks how to use those organs better with this pump perfusion now for liver transplant that has been uh, proves to be uh, improvement. But we still face it with about 20% of the liver that we actually go and we look, we cannot use. Um, because we know the consequences of that. So that's another big challenge. With that, obviously, diabetes and obesity is increasing, especially in the, in the Southeast, but in general across the entire country. And as you know, alcohol has really significant increase in recent years, especially with COVID uh, uh, pandemic have really kind of skyrocketed in recent times. So we frequently have more people coming into the list for alcohol-related disease, but at the same time, we have more donors that are not known to be uh, alcoholic, but really have impact in the quality of the organs that we are receiving. So uh, transplant program has a risk aversion related to regulatory oversight, consequence of the poor outcomes, sometimes pro programmatic priorities. And this has some, seems has sometimes to do with the, uh, with the fees and the payments related to liver transplant. Um, the public view of using living donors and the cost of transplantation. The cost of liver transplantation, I'm not going to go in detail, but as you know, as you are using more marginal organs and we are using more marginal recipients, patients stay longer in the hospital. That is related, that correlate with the, with the expenses in the liver transplant. And as you know, especially here in Maryland, that we have a cap payment for liver transplants. 
if patients don't do well frequently, patient, uh, uh, we end up losing money for liver transplant. And that is something that happened really across the entire country. So the question is how we can help patients that have uh, that are sick but are not to be put on the top of the list. And I'm sure that the majority of you are very familiar with what is called the, what is the MEL score, the model for end stage liver disease. But the MEL score that go between six and forty, and we know that patient that has very high MEL score usually get an offer and the liver transplant pretty quick. Uh, but if you have a male score with less than 30 and above 15 or below 15, and you have complication of cirrhosis, patient is struggling significantly to, to identify or to receive offer for liver transplant. And that's really the area that I think that we can serve better be a living donor. And that's the area that uh, we focus to, to help these people, to help those patients to do better. Now, in terms of how we can expand the organ pool, and, and one of them obviously is living donor that I will explain next. But we have used all these other technologies and techniques to um, to increase the donor pool. And uh, we use pump perfusion. We use aged donors. We use donors with hepatitis C, donor with hepatitis B, fatty livers, donor after cardiac de death or DCDs. Start some, some type of cancer patient that die and we can use the, the organs for and some other technologies such such a bioartificial organs and xenotransplantation. Those two are in process and I mean, there's a lot of progress made on that, but we're still not ready for prime time in the clinical practice. So at this point, either you get the deceased donor or you get the living donor. And in terms of ex vivo normothermic perfusion, some of you may be familiar. We're not going to expand on that, but we are being one of, kind of one of the leaders, uh, along with other centers in the country, in terms of these two pump perfusion machines uh, that can be used in the US. Uh, Transmedic recently got FDA approved, and also Oxford machine that has been used. And what they do is they perfuse those organs with warm and uh, normal human blood and allow you to extend the survival of that organ. Um, of that organ. I'm not going to expand much on this, but this is a huge area of, uh, of uh, research today and in the clinic and also clinical uh, research. Uh, the group in Switzerland already developed a machine that can support, it's called uh, liver for life. Uh, and what they do is add a dialysis machine to this and other um, management of biomarkers and they have extended the survival of the liver outside the body for more than seven days that obviously will change the entire reality of transplant as you keep the organ out uh, ex vivo and perfuse and viable you can really act on that organ and treat several diseases and several fatty issues and so but that's going to be a topic for another day of of, uh, of discussion in terms of living donor, for those that know a little bit, we can either transplant the right lobe, we can transplant the left lobe, and in pediatric cases, usually we can transplant just the left lateral segment of a potential donor. And what is the rationale to do living donor? Number one, this started in, in, in countries where living where disease donor is really not an option. Uh, Asian countries like Japan or Korea or, or, or uh, Turkey, where uh, disease donor is, a, is, is really a kind of not the good options, the minority of those patients receive liver transplant via disease donor. Um, so they need to come up with some uh, some options and living donors. So that is how they started. Now, here in the US, we have a significant change in the donor and the recipient characteristic. We see donors increasing age, increasing obesity, increasing alcohol, recipient being older, recipient have uh, more obesity, recipients to be um, to be more uh, prone to have complications. As you all know, hepatitis C is really not the lead cause of liver transplant anymore. So now we have a lot of NASH, older people with NASH, obesity, and alcohol. So, and sometimes those cases get very complicated, but having the option of living donor is always a good thing. And then more organs are needed for transplantation, clearly, living donor clearly increase the organ pool. The outcomes are good, now described to be even better than the deceased donors, and the donor surgery over time has become a safe operation. Uh, as you can see, Korea and Turkey and Saudi Arabia are the three leading countries that, where we get a lot of information and improvements in living donation. And we know also that in general, the population is willing to donate. In the US, about 
three every four people that had been asked are willing to donate for the loved one. And when there was cash in the middle in the, in the list, it's even more than that. Um, so we have experience accumulated. The Asian countries are really great experience and leadership in this area. Here in the US, we have the H World Consortium. Uh, Toronto continue to be the lead in North America. Now, uh, Pittsburgh also has become an important program, as well as us and other programs. Uh, we, we think that there is a little more increased acceptance in the US uh, medical community. And for the first time last year, it has been proved that the three year survival outcomes here, as you can see in UNOS, is higher. The three and the five year survival is higher when you receive a living donor than when you have um, a deceased donor. And Peggy, can I ask you, is this an hour? Uh, because in my schedule, I appear 30 minutes. Is this an hour talk? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I don't need to rush that much because I have a few more slides I didn't want to rush it. So, um, for the first time last year, the report of the UNOS report identified that the three and five years patient and graft survival is better if you receive a, a living donor compared if you receive a, a, a deceased donor. So it's clearly now become a great and safe option for those patients in need of liver transplantation. University of Maryland has a great reputation. I, I think that you can see here if lower the better and you can see that in terms of volume we are not the largest center in the country but we clearly in terms of outcome is one of the top centers in terms of good outcomes compared with other institutions uh, all across the country in terms of donor risk for 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 living donor some people uh, obviously talking with patients patient get very concerned about the risk the mortality continue to be very low uh, continue to be, you know, 0 0.4 and 0 0.1 um, percent, uh, depending on right love or left love, whatever donation is. And this is just for donor, obviously. It's not for the recipient, just for the donors. Um, but as the center get more experience, the mortality has dropped. There's no reason any dead in donors. And we have become more experts to identify what donors we can use and which one we can't. The complication rate in terms of small complications is about 30%, uh, but serious complications like uh, like area of necrosis or like bile requiring uh, some cases that are require retransplantation is about 2%. The H2O, which is this group that was created in the US in, in the in the um, in the early 2000s, developed uh, has a long-term follow-up of 760 donors. Uh, the majority of them they write love, that some of them left love and they came up with um, the, the, this, this rate of complications that we, you show here. And they also show that 85% of them really resolve pretty quick. So the few patients that have complications, but when that happens, it's, it's very concerning for the patient and for the institution. In terms of we look more around the world, and there's a different, obviously, perception of what the complications, um, in the way that the complication is are accepted or not. There is about 23 cases in the, in the world now of out of almost 12,000 cases of donor death. And the majority of them happen at the beginning. It's recently been described very few, I think a couple dead in the last few five years. Um, but still the risks are there. We know that and we always present that to the patient several times to, uh, so they are very uh, aware of the potential risk of complications. Um, also has been proved that depending on the need is depending on the risk that you're willing to take. As you can see, this was presented where you have a triangle where you, in each of the points you have donor safety, the need, and the, uh, and the recipient outcome expected. And depending on the area, for example, in pediatric, we know that the need is high, the donor is safe because the area that delivered that you really take is very small, and then the recipient's outcome are very close. So you can see that in pediatric, there's no doubt that this this is, is probably the best option, living donor for pediatric patient that need the liver transplant. Uh, if you can see when you use a left lobe, um, you can see that it's very safe for the donor because you are, you are using the smaller part of the liver, and but you but also you cannot accomplish all the need that you that you're supposed to cover. Uh, so you can transplant less patient. And the risk outcomes have been excellent too. When you use a right lobe, you are taking a little bit of risk on the donor side 
but you increase, you can cover more needs, you can transplant more patients. And even when the outcomes now have proven to be excellent, and I will probably at this point put it up here, still the outcomes in general for the right love is excellent. The only thing that you are taking a little bit more risk on the donor, obviously. And the last thing I wanna mention about our donor champion program, we developed this donor champion and we are not unique. Several other programs have developed that. But what this is really is a education and training and education for patients to understand two things, the need of transplant and the challenges that they face if they do not have a, a living donor. And we talk about waiting this mortality, pay complications if for trans, those patients that receive transplant with the male score is very high, and we try to go over that. What we observe that if you educate those patients, they really, you really see a significant improve, increase in the volume of patients willing to donate for, for liver transplant. And uh, like I always said, I think a lot of more patients come to, to being evaluated for transplant. There is a complete lack of understanding what transplantation is and what they can expect from this. So any education is good, but what we have observed that if you do education for living donor, you see increase significant increase in the number of, of, of family members that are willing to donate. So I will kind of stop here. So we have some time for, uh, for discussion later uh, after Dr. Barry finished, but I will say that living donor is the best uh, or a good option to alleviate the organ shortage that we're facing and especially good for those patients with a male score between 12 and 30 or 28. I put 28 there because all uh, hepatocellular cancer patients get the male of 28. Um, so until there, if they don't have HCC, anyone between the male of 12 and 28 struggle for a long time to receive an organ. So that is what living donor cannot do the best, the best of the, uh, of the best good. Uh, liver transplantation requires a time of committed individual with expertise that we do have, and we have also a committed physician advocate to advocate for um, for living donors. Some of the outreach and education that we're doing here, but also with patients that we do webinars. The patient can every month we do a webinar where the patient can come up or the physician can come up, and we have discussion about the, the, the stage of the waiting list, the risk and the benefit of using living donor. We're doing some community partnerships uh, with some schools, some other entities to promote living donation. And clearly, you have to have a clear institutional support to remove all the barriers for those donors that are willing to donate. And ethical issues that have been discussed in this, in this case, we have been discussed this and I think quite approved. And, and the understanding of the, the better good that we do with living donor uh, is clear to our institution. It's up to us to bring it to colleagues like yours and, and your institution to make that very clear for for a patient as we present this to patient. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to stay so we can answer any potential question. Thank you. Dr. Maluf, there was one question for you in the chat. What percentage of liver is excised from the donor and most commonly from which lobe? Thank you. That's depending the if we do right lobe or, or left lobe donation. Um, we in you know right lobe is as you know is sixty percent. So we can either take sixty percent, fifty percent, or or forty percent of the liver if you do right or left. We because we have more experience in right lobe, we tend to do right lobe donors uh, donors, but we never go above sixty percent. Even what we know by the surgical expertise you can transplant you can excite or up to 70 percent in a patient um, safely but we try to never go above 60 percent at the same time i will say that also depending age we know that if somebody is less than 30 years old you can go and take 70 percent and the liver will do very well when you get to to a, a, above 45 or 50 years old then it become more challenging so Depending, but in general, we try to stay in the 50% range of, of resection. Hey, start, uh, Dr. Bati, start right away. Is your question? The end. I didn't. Answer. I didn't. Are you uh, asking questions? Sorry. Can I answer a question? Ask a question. Yes. Yes. yes of yes. course. Um, 
what uh this the living donor um procedure involves uh taking the patient to the operating room yes, yes. and uh what percentage of patients uh fail uh the criteria for living donor in the operating room so that's a great question and we know that about every four patients that uh, propose to be living donors we end up with one uh, so in general from the phone calls to being in the OR is about 10 to 1 from the patient that go through the evaluation is about 4 to 1 so and that when you go to the OR with the technology that we have today it's very rare at the beginning it was described about between 3 and 4 percent patient that you go to the OR and you find something that you didn't see in the MRI and you will stop I will say that never never happened to me, but I'm sure that sometime may, it may happen. Same unexpected thing, like an artery I was not seen in the, so it's all about the anatomy. But you know, with new technology, we use this MIVIS, which is a 3D uh, software that really kind of help us. So I would say between one and 3% is a non-go when you go to the award. It's very rare. Well, uh, excuse me, but I'm, what I'm talking about is the, um, the situation where the patient, uh, when he's taken off the ventilator in the operating room, uh, continues to breathe or uh, has signs of life and is unable to be declared dead. You're talking about DCD then, James, right? So you're talking about donor after cardiac, then not about living donor, correct? Oh, okay. Or yeah, so the DCD, you're right. So in DCD, is about patient that did are extubated, I will guess is, is about 40% of them that end up to be donors. Uh -huh. And it's about half that they will never don a rest or they arrest too late to be used as a donor. But that's, you know, that disease donor, correct? Okay. Got Thank it. You. Thank you. One more question and then we can switch it back to Dr. Body. What are the most common complications for the donor? So the most complication for the donor, I will say, we, I, we see three three things frequently. Um, complication is is uh, hernias, obviously, like any surgery, hernias. Frequent, a uh, few times we see bileaks, and most of them can be resolved by ERCP. Some patients you see jaundice post post donation. We see some patients, especially when you go above fifty percent resection that you see that the bilirubin go up to four or five and the patient get a little bit yellow and then after three or four days go away. Um, but most of the complications are those that happen the first two weeks. Um, after two or three weeks, as you know, the liver regenerate, especially in young people, pretty fast. We have seen livers almost go back to normal size in about six weeks. So once you go through the first two weeks, uh, complications are very, very rare. Okay, it's like any lady for him. All right, well, we can get Dr. Barry to start and then uh, we can still get more questions at the end. I will be here anyway. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chandra Bhatti. I'm one of the transplant surgeons at uh, University of Maryland. I'm a surgical director of liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. Um, first, I would like to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, liver, liver transplantation and particularly transplant uh, oncology world, which is relatively new and emerging. Um, and if I have, if you have a questions, please let me know um, and I'll answer at the end. In this talk, I'll discuss mainly about transplant oncology world, what is coming up, what are the various indications for transplantation. Uh, Dr. Malouf has already covered the living donor part and I'll talk a little bit more, what is the living donor role in these patient population. So in today's talk, main discussion about non-HCC patient, as you all are aware that the hepatocellular carcinoma is a main indication for liver transplantation. But we'll discuss mainly non-hepatocellular carcinoma today. So when we talk about the transplant oncology, um, as you all are aware that the, the hepatocellular carcinoma patients who are within the Milan criteria get exception point. As Dr. Malouf discussed before about um, uh, MELD score, they get exception point and that MELD goes to close to 27, 28 based on uh, where you are. 
There is additional criteria which are UCSF, and there are a ton of more other criteria, including Toronto criteria, Assan criteria, UCSF, and other criteria where you don't get exception point. Living donor liver transplantation is an important tool to get these patients uh, offered what is the best treatment for them. And uh, these patients can be offered living donor liver transplantation since they're not eligible to receive extra point from UNOS. We discussed about uh, liver metastasis from neuroendocrine tumor. We discussed a little bit about cholangiocarcinoma, and we'll talk about two different kinds of a cholangiocarcinoma. One is an intrahepatic, and one is an extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Means what we're talking is a, a is a Klaskin kind of a tumor. A little bit talk about hepatic epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, and the most controversial topic in today's discussion will be colorectal metastasis. As you all know, that this is relatively more emerging field. And I will tell you what is the current data and who are eligible for liver transplantation. Going back to a little bit of what Dr. Malouf discussed, that as you can all see, that we we, we have about 10 to 12,000 patients currently getting um, uh, currently listed for liver transplantation, and only 6 to 7,000 patients get liver transplantation. So there is a huge gap between demand and supply, and that's what the living donor um, plays an important role in providing additional donors. The number of living donor transplantation has been pretty stationary and uh, relatively few centers across the countries are doing it. This is the next slide, sorry. The next slide shows about the, the current wait list mortality as you can all see that at about 100 patients who got listed in 36 months, about 18% of the patients die while waiting for liver transplantation just because of the discrepancy between um, um, patient listed and uh, organ available. So now we talk about uh, uh, cancer development. And as you can see, this is a timeline for development of these patients who received liver transplantation. 1996 was the era when Milan, uh, uh, Mon Monsefero from Milan basically discovered that the patients who have three uh, lesions less than three centimeter do much better in comparison to any patients who you transplant. And that's where the Milan criteria came in and these patients were considered for additional point, otherwise they would never receive a, a liver transplantation. When we move forward in 2005, that's when the Mayo Clinic came up with the Mayo Protocol, which we'll talk a little bit later on about those patients, that um, the patients who have a class skin tumor receive a particular dedicated protocol, and they do reasonably well after liver transplantation in comparison to providing the metasection. Then in 2007, again from the Milan group, they came up with the patients who have a neuroendocrine tumor metastasizing to the liver. And again, they showed an excellent outcome. We'll again discuss what are the indications and contraindication towards later part of the talk. In 2013, that's when the colorectal metastasis came into play and group from Norway came up with the idea that these are the patients can be served with liver transplantation as long as, as, long as pick the right patients. And we'll again discuss a little bit later on. Uh, Toronto group Sebastian, who came up with the idea of doing the same thing with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which has traditionally been considered a contraindication for liver transplantation, and it still is considered for a contraindication, but there are selected criteria where you can offer them a liver transplantation. Similar patient was re-emphasized by a Houston Methodist group in, um, um, uh, from Lunsford, and she did similar kind of a transplantation in those patients. Now let's talk a little bit more in detail about cholangiocarcinoma. As you all know, cholangiocarcinoma is a malignant tumor of ability system. About 10% of hepatobiliary malignancy is present as a cholangiocarcinoma. Second most uh, type of a tumor after hepatocellular carcinoma. When we talk, there are three different types. Intrahepatic, which is present inside the liver. Perihylar means present in the duct, just outside the liver, mainly in a hilar plate. The third one we talked about, the distal cholangiocarcinoma, where the Whipple operations play more role and it's more towards we're talking mid common bile duct as well as a lower common bile duct when we look at their outcomes after surgery their outcome five-year survival ranges from 25 to 45 percent which is not great the multiple risk factor which has been um, sort of uh, said that they could cause us more risk of cholangiocarcinoma particularly psc colidocal cyst and stone formation with multiple parasites present in the liver now we talk about the perihylar, which was again publicized in 2005, 2006 in the form of a Mayo protocol, mainly coming from Mayo. Uh, and these are the criteria which they used it. 
these patients were undisectable. The, the tumor was present above the cystic duct. They had no extra hepatic disease and there was nothing present inside the liver. They received uh, a sandwich side of a treatment where in the form of neoadjuvant treatment, where they received external beam uh, radiation and a 5-FU. They received brachytherapy and a 5-FU until the transplant was done. When they were ready for transplant, they underwent an exploratory laparotomy, confirmed that there is no extrahepatic disease. Once they confirm extrahepatic disease, they underwent a liver transplantation. The first data was published in 2006, where they did 19, they put the 19 patients under this protocol. Only eight patients were, uh, only 11 patients completed the protocol and received transplantation. And as you can see, the median follow of 44 months, and they had all patients alive. They did a follow-up study where 71 patients were uh, put into the study and 38 patients underwent the transplantation. And you see three and five year survival is 82 to 80, 82, 82% after liver transplantation, which is in comparison to we are talking about 25 to 45%, which is almost more than double. They found some prognostic factor in these patients um, that the older patients who have received gallbladder surgery before and CA99 more at the time of uh, transplantation were known to have a poor outcome. Further studies were done uh, using the same protocol, U.S. multicentric study published in 2012, 12 U.S. different centers, 287 patients, five-year disease-free survival was 65%. Again, way better than having a 25-30% patient. Two other studies which confirmed the similar kind of outcome. And as you can see, the overall five-year uh, survival rate without Mayo was 21%, with the Mayo 60%. And similar with the liver transplantation, 64% versus the resection, 18%. So as you can see, the transplantation offer much better chances of survival in comparison to patients who are receiving uh, just pure resection or any sort of a chemotherapy. Now we talk about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. As I mentioned, this is more controversial, and they do not receive extra point from UNOS, though the patient with the intra, uh, with the very high local angiocarcinoma do receive extra point from UNOS, and they get same point as HCC, while these patients do not receive extra point. And there is a reasoning behind it, because we have done retrospective studies in those patients where liver transplantation was done with the thought process that they either have a PSC or hepatocellular carcinoma, and they were found to have actually a cholangiocarcinoma. And we noted the outcomes are much worse. That's why it was not favored to do a transplantation in these patients. Two studies, one from the large Spanish studies, again, they showed that the disease-free survival, five-year, 27%. Not great, but still there. The Toronto study, which again confirmed that these patients have uh, if they have a very early intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, less than two centimeter, the five-year risk, risk of recurrence is 60, uh, 18% in comparison to 65%. They again showed that the very early intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma have a five-year survival of 65%. Again, we're we're talking that this is a risk. This is an area which is developing. We are not there where we can say this is as good as this there, but still, 65% is way better than the patients who are having outcomes in 25 to 40%. Now let's discuss a little, little bit about the metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen large neuroendocrine tumors studied in a liver with multiple symptoms. Patients keep receiving lentrotide on a monthly basis and they have multiple symptoms. These patients typically have a bilobar disease and cannot receive a resection. These patients could be served with the transplantation. Again, the patients, most of the patients uh, who are present is about 10% of all hepatic uh, neoplasm, 25 to 90% of the patients who have a neuroendocrine tumor do present with some kind of a liver metastasis disease. And when we're talking about five-year survival in patients with liver metastasis is only 40%. So that is something which we can offer to these patients and increase their life expectancy. There are some prognostic factors which are described in the literature who the, the tumors which produce hormone tend to do worse. The degree of tumor differentiation, poorly differentiated tumor will do worse. Again, number of hepatic lesions also has a role in how much, how well they're gonna do it or not. When we look at the studies which are published, there are two major studies. One was ELITA, which is a transplant organization, Europe, which collect all the data similar like UNOS. They published um, in 2013, 
they showed the five-year overall survival is 73%. Again, much better than what we were talking, 30 to 40%. Here, they, they selected patients, and they selected patients where the hepatic involvement was less than 50%. Those patients did much better. Similar from the Milan group, which we talked about, presented uh, the data which initially they did in 2007, followed by in 2016. They had 42 patients who received liver transplantation, and you can see 97% survival five years in comparison to 51, almost double. So the liver transplantation do offer a significant role in their overall life expectancy. Based on these studies, UNOS has come up with some guidelines that any patient who's less than 60 have resection of primary disease, or we don't know what the primary is, well differentiated or moderately differentiated cancer, mitotic rates less than 10, and less than 20% key, 67. If these patients fulfill those criteria, they can be considered for liver transplantation. The most important part, which is important here, is that the metastatic part is still less than 50%. If it's over 50%, they are typically not considered. And I think that's where the living donor plays a role. If they are more than 50%, they still get benefit, but they could not get a point. And I think that's where the living donor plays an important role. Now we talk a little bit about the, the colorectal cancer, which is again, most controversial topic. Most of people don't even know that, the, that we can offer liver transplantation for these patients. Just to give a little bit of idea, third most common cancer worldwide, 1.3 million cases diagnosed every year. Almost 700,000 patients die from colorectal cancer. 25% of the patient presents with synchronous metastasis, and about 50% of them will develop liver metastasis, whether at the same time or later down the stage. This is just the overall brief, what is the treatment options? As, any, as you can see, the transplant is not part of it. And hopefully with the time going along with more and more studies become available, there will be transplant at some point. So when we look at the outcome after uh, surgery, and as you can see, five-year survival is 47 to 60% after curative hepatectomy. Sometimes we do uh, liver surgery in patients who are not a curative intent, but sort of a deep bulk and give a chemotherapy and see if we can make them resectable. But if you look at the curative hepatectomy outcomes, they are only 45 to 60%. Almost 40 to 75% patients do get recurrence out of which 50% do recurrence in liver, and the liver resection is only visible in about 40% of the patients. So most of the patients who present, present with the advanced disease where it's not resectable. So I want to give you an idea that this is a new kind of a surgery which we can offer in the patients where most of the people think that it's not resectable because it's a bilobar disease, where what we could do is a two-stage operation, what we call as a liver partition and a portal vein ligation where this, just to give you an example, that the lesions, if you look at that, there are four lesions in a right lobe and two lesions on a left lobe. If we take the right hepatectomy, we don't have enough volume to take out all the tumors. In this situation, we can go ahead and do the surgery, take out the lesion in a left lobe, ligate the right portal vein, let the left lobe without any tumor grow, and then go back in and do the right hepatectomy. This is becoming more and more common in patients who have a bilobar disease. Now we talk, what are the outcomes? Why did we start thinking that the colorectal metastasis could be a, a potential uh, case uh, for liver transplantation? We did liver transplantation for colorectal metastasis in early year, as early as 1963, 1964. When we looked at the data between 68 and 95, there were about 50 cases. And as you can see, five years survival wasn't great, only 18%. Again, in looked in the Euro, similar kind of a database, the 30-day mortality was 30% and five-year survival was 12%. So that's why we thought it's probably not a good idea to do a transplant in these patients because that's not an optimum use of liver transplantation. This is the same data, five-year data, data, five-year survival, 18% from European liver transplant registry. That's when this study and this trial came in from Norway. Norway is a strange and a little bit different um, situation than what we have in the United States that they have more donors than they can transplant. So they started transplanting selected colorectal patients. They came up with the idea of 2006. They did an open trial at, at Norway. They had an average wait period of less than a month. So they could do these kind of things, which we typically could not have done it. They included the patients where there's a primary tumor is gone, six weeks of chemotherapy is received, 
they have a non-resectable liver metastasis confirmed by two group of hepatobility surgeon. Patient is in an ex excellent uh, performance status. They all underwent a staging laparotomy to make sure that there's no tumor outside the liver. Frozen sections were done. When they confirmed that the, there's no tumor outside, they underwent a transplantation. So they presented data in 2013 and they had 25 patients List, uh, in, in a trial, 21 patients underwent a disease donor liver transplantation with the median follow up of 27 months. And you can see five year survival is 60%. We're talking in comparison to non resectable cancer where the five year survival is less than 10 to 15%. We are achieving 60% of drug survival. Again, the biggest concern was the recurrence was achieved in the recurrence occurred in 90% of the patients, but all of them were alive. And most of the patients were able to receive a secondary treatment for those recurrent tumors. Again, it was a small study, first, this first study, which actually was done as a randomized trial. So there was a follow-up study from multiple European center, and they also showed that if the right patient were used, five-year survival is 50%. Again, four patients were alive without any cancer recurrence up to almost four years. That's a great achievement. Again, those patients would die typically within a less than a year. So they are current, they did the second part of a study where they broadened their horizon and included more patients into this. Again, these are the various indications. I'm not going to go into detail, but typically it says the patients are bilobar disease, non-resectable, have a CEA less than 80, not very surgically complicated, and lesions, no lesions less than 10 centimeters, and more, no more than 30 cent lesions. They did 15 patients with the median wait period of one month. And as you can see, they had a patient's lesion up to 100 metastasis in one patient. And if you look at those patients, they come up with various score called Fong score and Oslo score, and their score were low. And their outcome, 36 month follow up, five year survival, 83%. As you can see, gain a great improvement in an outcome in a patient who are going to die within less than 12 months. Again, the disease free survival was not great. 30% of the patient recurred in three years. But again, the patient survived, 85% patient, 83% patient survived five years. That's a big achievement. And survival after relapse means some kind of a recurrence are kept. Still, four year is 73%, which is which is tremendous improvement in their outcomes. These are the two comparison between two trials. They, you, as you can see, they won't become more aggressive in CICA two trial than they were in a CICA one trial, where they had a limited liver lesions while they were gone more aggressive up, and there were more patients in there. They come up with the idea that these are the prognostic factors which will define their um, outcomes: tumor diameter less than 5.5, CEA less than 80 time between liver transplantation and a colorectal resection is, should be ideally more than two years. And a stable disease. If disease progress while they're on a chemotherapy, they should not undergo a transplant. These are current ongoing trials, various trials happening throughout the world, again, looking into various patients, which are the ideal candidate. These are the two scores, which we talked briefly about, Oslo scores and Fong scores. Again, less the score, better their outcomes are. So this is what we are uh, currently trying to sort of go more in detail and trying to come up with the best score, which will be ideal for these patients. Now we get into ethical dilemma that the current weightless mortality in these patients about 17 to 20%. How do we justify that we transplant those patients where there is a recurrence rate and overall survival is as good as other patients? So we are not there where we could use these disease uh, donors because we have to consider those patients who have a primary liver disease, not secondary to the cancer other than HCC. So that's where the living donor liver transplantation, you saw the outcome, 85% if you have a loved one who has a liver cancer and they can survive five years, 80, the chances of five year survival is 85%. I'm sure a lot more people would be interested. So this is where I think the living donor liver transplantation play important and a huge role. Dr. Malouf covered all these parts, so I'm going to skip the living donor liver risk and a discard liver, which Dr. Malouf has already talked. So here we are going to start doing those patients. I'm coming from VCU where we did these transplanted. We have transplanted these patients. The, the, the patients we transplanted, we have current 16-month data with zero recurrence. And we are going to include 
exactly the same protocol, which is the Oslo protocol, which says 18 to 70 year old has a clinical approval colorectal liver metastasis. We do biopsy if there's a questionable, these will be the various tumor characteristic features pretty much based on all the trials saying the same thing what we have discussed there, and we're gonna include those patients in this study. Anybody who has wild type, Keras wild type, mutant wild type, they will be included, but their Oslo score has to be less than three. We will exclude any patients who fail our transplant evaluation or have a BARF positive tumor, pregnant, and other substance abuse. Typically, who's not candidate for liver transplantation would not be a candidate for this. Otherwise, most of the patients would be considered for liver transplantation. To conclude my talk, liver transplantation for colorectal metastasis is evolving while it is getting more, it is established for cholangiocarcinoma. And I think we are not there in terms of when we are talking about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. As you all can see, initial results are encouraging with survival over 50% and a recurrence rate is high, but still survival is 50% even after recurrence rate. Typically in these patients, as you know, the recurrence rate, uh, the survival was less than 10% five years. We are my biggest question to all we, when we talk among ourselves, that we are transplanting the best tumor characteristics among the worst patients. What if we choose the best tumor characteristics in the best patients? Means like in a, when we do HCC, we pick three tumors less than three centimeters. But for colorectal metastasis, we are picking the patient who have bilobar disease everywhere. What if we did the similar kind of a treatment where, okay, three tumors less than three centimeters and see their outcome. But right now we don't have unlimited supply, so we cannot do it. So that's why we are offering to the patients which are typically not a candidate for any other treatment. And this is sort of a resort treatment for them. Role of transplantation in a resected liver metastasis, as I said, yet to be determined. Living donor are the most important pool for these cancer patients, which typically would not get a point. And that's where Dr. Muluk's previous talk is important that any patients who have a liver disease should be considered for liver transplantation. And these patients, if they don't get a transplant from the list, they should be able to receive transplant from um, the living donor liver transplantation. I'll stop my talk here. We'll take any questions if you have. ask two questions sure uh the first is um uh five year survival one or two year survival that's important but could you um comment on the quality of life with this uh extended survival that would be the first question and the second question when you do a staging laparotomy and uh, determine that there's no further cancer it would seem to me that the patients who have recurrence after transplant do have this micrometastasis that were somewhere, but were, were unable to be picked up with the staging laparotomy. So how can you be sure that a staging laparotomy is uh, completely accurate? So those are my two questions. So the, the first question, the quality of life is excellent. The first patient which we did before I moved from BC to here, is a school teacher. She's back to work. She's going, doing as every other transplant patient will be doing it. So their quality of life is pretty much normal. You, there is no difference in comparison to anybody else except they need to take some immunosuppression and other medications. But other than that, there is no difference in their quality of life. When we talk about the patients who had some kind of a recurrence, even their quality of life is very good. We have there are a lot of data published about quality of life in these patients who got the recurrence and they all are, are still living with the lung metastasis. Some of them had a resurgery for the resections or microvibrations, but their quality of life is excellent. When we go to the second question, unfortunately, you're very right that the, the staging laparoscopy or laparotomy is not the ideal way to know whether they have a recurrence or, or whether they have extra hepatic disease or not. But we have to do what we have, what we have to do, what we have available right now. And the only way to find out about those macro metastases is by staging laparotomy. There is currently no way to find out about those micro metastases. That's why we are using a very strict criteria in these patients 
that the patients, if they progress while they're on a chemotherapy, they're not eligible for transplantation. So there are some ways by which we are checking those patients, but where there is no physical way to confirm that there is no micrometastasis present in the body. Having said that, there are more and more tests coming up, which are based on a tumor DNA and a, and a cancer work. And I'm hoping in a coming future, those tumor, those tests will become more and more prevalent, and we should be able to incorporate those tests into our selection criteria if these patients have those high tumor burden or that DNA is present, then we should not transplant those people. But we are not there yet. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions, thank you for uh, thank you to everybody for attending this uh, weekly grand round, and uh, especially I want to thank uh, Dr. Daniel Malouf, uh, MD, and uh, uh, Dr. Chandra uh, Bhatti uh, for uh, their informative lecture. And uh, we will appreciate if you have any more topic, we can sign up more. Thank you. And I'm writing my email address and my cell phone. If anybody has any questions about liver cancer patients or have any patients, feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you very it. much. Thank you, everyone, for being uh, and, and uh, also Peggy, Dr. Chandra number is there. And if you need us, Peggy always can be in contact with us, and we don't mind to share the email or the phone number. So thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.